The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he received wahi from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, the first revelation, the first people he went to were his family. You know, he didn't go out to the community and start preaching while his family sat at home and didn't have the benefit, right? And so we find that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam focused on the people that were closest to him. But not always with faith. You know, sometimes I, I ask parents, you know, what's your relationship with your kids? And they'll say, you know, I'm, I'm, I try to be a good parent, I try to be a good father. And I say, what do you mean by a good father? I try to teach them the religion. So when's the last time we took them out for ice cream? He's like, that's not Muslim, sunnah, no. right? Prophet doesn't have ice cream, right? And the idea is that we've created this dichotomy that by being a good parent, our job is simply to transmit the knowledge, the information part of their faith without the experience, without what good akhlaq feels and looks like. You know, when the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he was sitting with his companions one time and they were discussing affairs of the state, this is a serious issue. This isn't something that they're just talking about like cricket, right? <laughs> like who's going to win Pakistan versus India? Or is Bangladesh going to make a run, right? No, this is a serious governmental issue. And he's sitting with his companions and with the law on and his daughter Fatima comes in. I want you to imagine you're sitting with your friends, your, your companions, and you're talking about something, right? Because Muslims love to talk about politics. So we're talking about politics, right? And your daughter comes in. And she starts saying, Dad, 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 what do you do? Or Mom, 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 what do you do? Right? You tell them, listen, go, go away. Mom's busy right now. Dad's busy right now. Go. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, because he understood the value of having a good relationship with his daughter. And it wasn't just, did you pray? Did you fast? No, but he understood having a a meaningful relationship with his daughter, he actually requested his companions, his sahaba, that he was discussing very important issues with, he requested them to give him a pause. Guys, I'll be right back. And he took his daughter Fatima, and he sat her down, knee to knee, and he interrupted his conversation of how to run the Islamic community, how to run the society of Islam, the welfare of the people, management as a governor, as a statesman, and he paused that entire conversation and he said, Fatima, how's your day going today? And how's your day going today? Is it going well? What's up? Tell me what's new. Had a conversation with his daughter, daddy-daughter time, right? But sometimes we would view this in our skewed view of religion <laughs> as being frivolous. The Prophet Muhammad also never saw positive relationships with his children or grandchildren as frivolous. Ever. He always knew that it contributed to something higher. That's why when the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi was one time praying, you know, prayer, subhanAllah, it's so beautiful. I remember one time I was praying uh, at my work. I used to work at the Apple Store, and I was praying in the, in the back room, and I was making sajda on the floor. And one of the guys saw me making sajda, and he's like, Abdul, what are you looking for, right? And I was like, uh, <laughs> I didn't answer, but I was like, my face is on the floor, I don't think I can see anything, right? But someone else then corrected him and was like, no, Gary, right? He's praying. And Gary was like, oh my God, I ruined his prayer and he ran away, right? But the idea is that when they saw that it was prayer, they felt what? So respected. The action I was doing was so revered. They were so admiring of what I was doing because I was praying. So I, I know the Prophet was praying and prayer is such a beautiful dedication of, of a person's you know, relationship with their creator. And sajda, sujood, of all the positions in prayer were taught by the Prophet and that's where the slave is closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So sujood is the moment where, you know, it's beautiful. You know, you want to see, you see someone making sujood in the masjid, and you're like, wow, look at that khushul. Look at that dedication. Look at that commitment to their deen. They must be, they must be making du'a to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They must be asking Allah, begging Him for His mercy and His blessings. And you just admire a person who has their face on the ground. Think of it. Your face is the most noble part of your body. So much so that the Prophet ﷺ prohibited us from ever striking the face, right? Yes or no? But you, when it's time to pray, you take the most noble part of your body and you put it where? On the floor where people's feet were just a few moments ago. So when you see that, you can't help admire it. You know what kids see, little kids? They see a horsey. So we see someone dedicated to their Lord, worshiping, praying, prostrate, but when kids see it, they see it's playtime. And the Prophet saw sometimes two grandchildren, and Hassan and Hussein, they saw this, and the narration is very famous. 
They jumped on the back of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Can you imagine, Shaykh, if this happened to you? What would the community do if the kids jumped on your back during Sudu? The community. <laughs> no, if it happened to any of us, what would we do? Right? There would be some sort of ship shiver chuckle coming somewhere, right? Flying across the hit him, hit him off the back. You know what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did? He waited. Because they were playing on his back. And then what happened was one of the companions behind the Prophet ﷺ became concerned because he knew that the Prophet ﷺ's sujood, his sajda, wasn't this long. So he looked up because he thought maybe perhaps the Prophet ﷺ fell ill or something happened to him. And when he looked up, all he saw were two kids woo, riding on the back of the Prophet ﷺ. So when the Prophet ﷺ finally got up from sajda, finally, and finished the prayer, he did his taslim, he looked back at the companions and he apologized and said, I'm sorry. He goes, pardon, pardon that, that extension. I did not want to disturb their playtime. Just completely different than how we would do it. If some kid, you know, at one time I was at a masjid when I was younger, and it was thought, we, you know, Ramadan is such a happy time. Everyone's so happy in Ramadan, subhanAllah. May Allah allow us to see another Ramadan. It's so happy, the masjid is full, your stomach is full, unfortunately, right? Everyone's just so happy, you know, there's ruhab stuff flowing, everyone's just drinking ruhab stuff, right? Eating samosas, mashallah. And you know, kids, youth, they also get really happy, because they feel the energy in the masjid. And so they go to the masjid, and they might pray Aisha, and they might pray one or two rock, and then they want to play basketball, right? And so one time in the back of the masjid, it was a big masjid, in the back of the masjid some kids were talking. And after the prayer, a man got up and he looked back at the kids and he yelled at the top of his lungs. It was so embarrassing. I felt so embarrassed for him. He yelled at the top of his lungs. He said, all of you kids. And they all looked up. He said, get out and never come back. If you're not here to pray, then leave. And there are some people in this audience right now who are like, Takbir. Right? <laughs> like, you're happy for that. But you know what? That's not from the son of the Prophet Sallallahu my teacher, my shaykh, when he saw this, Shaykh Ahab, I still remember this, when he saw this, he went to that guy, you know what he said to him? He goes, you better make dua right now that Allah does not remove those kids from the masjid. Because if they leave and never come back, you're going to have a very difficult conversation on the day of judgment. Because you're going to be the reason they left. And the man was just turned ghost white. Because Khushua, by the way, has nothing to do with things going around you. And you know how, you know how I can prove this to you? You ready? Khushua has nothing to do with what's going around you. Have you guys ever been watching a really close game in the fourth quarter? You're watching them with the World Cup in the final minute, and it's tied. They had three minutes of stoppage time. Or in Ramadan, when it's two minutes till it's thought, and you're sitting there looking at that samosa. That's Khushua. Right? And no matter what anyone says at that moment, you do not hear what they say. When you're watching that game and it's super close, and you want to see who's going to win, hey, can you come help me with something? Hey, can you, can you hear me? Help them help me. Person's not listening at all. That's for sure. But when it comes to prayer, a grasshopper can lose his wudu 70 miles away and we'll hear it. Right? Something can happen where it's like, so when kids make some noise, we're like, oh, these kids, they're ruining my future. No. Your lack of fushu is ruining your fushu, right? So the Prophet Sallallahu I did not want to disturb their playtime. What do you think that did for the child's relationship with the masjid? That I can come to the masjid and have a good time. One time the Prophet Sallallahu was giving khutbah on a member, just like this, he was standing, and in the middle of the audience, little Hussein comes running, right? Little Hussein comes running, and he's wearing a shirt that's a little bit too big for him, so he's tripping. So the Prophet Sallallahu sees this, and he actually leaves the member. Do you know what the Jum'ah khutbah, do you know what it is? It's the first two rak'ah of Dhuhr. Instead of praying four for Dhuhr on Friday, we pray what? Two, right? We pray Jum'ah. But the khutbah is counted as the first two. So during this very important act of worship, the Jum'ah khutbah, he leaves the member, comes down, he picks up his grandson, Hussein, and he carries him. And he goes back on top of the member. And he says, this son, this kid, this boy, he's going to be a leader. And he continues to give the khutbah with Hussein in his arms. 
You know, this sounds like it's shocking to us because we'd never imagined doing it, but this was the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And if it's his sunnah, then who are we to question? If it's the way that he did things, then how can we have the audacity to think differently? And we wonder, we wonder why families are not masjid-centric. We wonder. Because we are importing our own desires and cultures instead of looking after his sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad So he had this idea, he had this way of making young people feel in his presence very special and very loved. The Prophet Muhammad was known to communicate love to children, to let kids know that he loved them. You know, one time I asked a group of young boys, how many of you, your parents said in the last few days, I love you? Right? Half of them raised their hands. I said, how many of you, out of the half of you, it was not because of a good grade you got, they all lowered their hands. Because it wasn't because of academics, it wasn't because of school. How many of you, your parents came to you and said, I appreciate you, I know that you make mistakes, but I know you're trying hard. And I love you because you're trying hard. How many of you, I'm not going to ask for a hand raise here, but how many of you, your parents said that to you growing up? You know the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? One time he kissed his grandchildren, Hassan Hussein, and a Bedouin Arab man came to him. And he said, you kiss your boys? You show love to your young boys? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, yes, of course. The man said, I have ten sons. Ten. And I have never once kissed them. Like he was trying to brag to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that I'm a man. My young boys are going to become men because the Arabs of Quraysh in that time, the Arabs of the Hijaz in the area, they were very big on like manliness, right? So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he heard this, that I have ten sons and I've never kissed one of them. He said back to the man, what can I do? How can I help you then if Allah has removed mercy from your heart? So this example of how you're trying to prove that you're a man to me and you're raising men, actually it's nothing more than an indication that you have no mercy in your heart. And he didn't say mercy with your kids, by the way. The Prophet Sallallahu said mercy completely, totally. So an indication that a person is merciful is how they treat their family. If a person cannot be merciful to their own children, they should not consider themselves merciful at all. Because our children should be our recipients of our mercy. We ask Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala to give us that mercy, inshaAllah. So we have this example from the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now that doesn't mean, by the way, that doesn't mean that he didn't give consequences or discipline, no. We know the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we know that along with his mercy, he also had structure. One time he was gathering the dates for zakat, for charity. He was gathering the dates to go hand out to people who were needy. And the people, the Hassan Hussein, they came because dates are like candy. Anyone ever had a Madini date before from Medina? You had dates in Medina before? Very sweet, right? So the kids ran to go grab some dates, and the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when uh, Hassan grabbed a date from the basket of charity, he, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam grabbed his wrist and said, No, this is not for you. This is for those who are needy. This is for the needy people. And Hassan looked and said, Oh, okay. Right? But why did this work? Why did this work? Why did the discipline, you know, a lot of you parents are going to say, Well, I have to repeat this to my kid like eight, nine times. They don't listen the first time. You know why? Because the Prophet's default mode of communication was always positive 